We're rocking this week with Joe Barisi, a special guitar version of Batter's Box. Let's roll Pensado's Place. What's up, everybody? Glad to have you back for episode 17, right, Herm? 1700. <laughs> that's in, that's in uh, Charlie Rose years. Canadian years. Canadian years. <laughs> anyway, glad to have you guys. Uh, it's, been a, it's been a fun week for me. Uh, I, as you know, I, I did a little bit of Facebook hanging out, and uh, Drew's getting me up to speed on Twitter. Not sure I'm fond of Twitter, Twitter as much as some people seem to be. Are you? Well, I, it's clear you're not fond of it because you're not saying it. <laughs> it's not Twitter. <laughs> Twitter. It's, uh, no, Twitter requires a certain kind of personality. I don't, even, I don't do well, it. Yeah. I, like, I, like, I like it when other people do it. Right. Um, I like reading 800,000 Cadis and Sean twi tweets, right, Drew? <laughs> yeah, it gets really ridiculous at times. Well, not Cadis and Sean. They don't no, not them. But those are our boys. Tweet, but you know. uh, I actually enjoy. Um, I like I like going to other people's Twitter and watch train wreck, train train wrecks. You know what happened. But man, today we've got Joe Barisi uh, back by popular demand. <laughs> Remember when we had the show in the '40s? We had Joe on back then. Yep. But Joe, I talked to him earlier in the week. Incredible human being. Um, just everything you'd want out of one of your idols to be. He's just a, a, a really cool guy. We've got a lot of great information. Um, he's going to stick with us for batter's box too, correct? He's, yeah, of course. Cool. Cool. Yeah, cool. Cool. Uh, Joe is is um, not only a gifted musician. We'll get into that in a little bit okay. about Joe. Well, why don't Excited we do our? Uh, can we do our homework? Let's do it. Here's our homework. Flash the page. You know how to reach us. Uh, David Twitter. David Facebook. David this. David that. David. And and all those are wrong. So <laughs> <laughs> so what it is is Herb's, Herb's cell number is and, and, uh, we'll five talk about five that five. Later. Bite me. Um, so reach us at our our Twitter handle is uh, at Pensados Place. You see it up on the screen. Our email is Pensados Place at thisweekend.com. Um, obviously, our Facebook page and uh, YouTube, where we get all your requests and comments. Keep that stuff coming. It absolutely ha helps us. We like to know what you want for the show. Um, as you know, in the corner office is our man, Drew. Drew. Hey, hey. What's going on, people? Hit me up in the chat room. We got folks in there? We do. We got quite a bit. Drew, you uh, got that little high level, <laughs> high level desk know, right? up in there. <laughs> Check it out, IKEA's finest. Watch out. Uh, <laughs> so we really hooked it up. We got <laughs> we got him a new set this week because he did so well last like week. A five year old made this for uh, us. <laughs> does this have anything to do with the blood test he took a couple of days ago? We're not, we, and we have we're to keep him like a little distance now. We're not supposed to share those results oh, that's yet. Fine, yeah. That's, that's a Twitter. <laughs> I'll Twitter. <laughs> yeah, Twitter reach him up. I'll reach you on Twitter with that. <laughs> so, anyways, make sure you get to us, get to our comments, and uh, let's get it popping. What do we got coming up? We got a cool ITL, correct? You gonna have to be a little smoother than that to figure out what I'm supposed to do next and let me know about it. That wasn't that good. <laughs> well, you know, you were looking down. I so. guess the hint was ITL. Oh, ITL. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and it's a continuation of, of last week. Yeah. Um, uh, the, last week and this week, our ITL was more uh, uh, equipment reviews, some equipment I really fell in love with, and uh, we're gonna kind of finish that up. Lay the groundwork for the giveaway on the 1073, which I like. Cool. And next week we're going to do a real special ATL, ITL, ATL is Atlanta. We're going to do an ITL in Atlanta. An, an ATL. An ITL and ATL. <coughs> Speaking of ATL, shout out to all my buddies down there. But this ITL is really good, and then we're going to come back out of that, and we're going to spend the rest of the day with Joe. Good. Let's roll ITL. Oh, you're going to see uh, Estero, great, great singer, great artist. Let's, let's, uh, you ready to roll it, Will? Yeah. Let's do it. What's up, people? Drew Adams here, Larry B Studios in uh, Studio A, the production room. We're gonna be uh, tracking Estero, one of one of the best songwriters out right now, and we're gonna be using the BAE 1073 portable preamp and also the EQ rack mount unit. So, let me check in with her, make sure we're good to go. We're gonna let this roll. Estero, you ready to go? I'm always ready, fool. <laughs> nice. Let's do it. <laughs> Okay, let's test it out. I feel the world with the way Where you put your arms around me I 
Close my eyes, melt away Your roller coaster ride So exciting To light to the light Your beautiful escape Oh, it's nice. I like, I get all the Cause you like, cause like the grit the, When you put your arms in the Cause you larger than life Yeah, you get all that really clear out here. It's good. It sounds great in here. Nice, nice. Yeah. Alright, let's get let's get a couple more. Okay. I feel the world away When you put your arms around me I close my eyes, melt away Your roller coaster ride So exciting All right, we're going to do one more. One more again. Slate it. <laughs> All right, let's get it. Close my eyes, melt away. Your roller coaster ride, so exciting. I keep swallowing that cuz. Cuz you lad. It sounds good. Okay, wanna do one more? Yeah, let's get one more though. Okay. Let her choose the best one, that'll be the one we use. Okay. I feel the world just away when you put your arms around me. I close my eyes, melt away. Your world goes away, so excited. Thank you, Estero. Thank you. It sounds lovely. Lovely. Did she hear it in here? No, she hasn't heard it in here. Oh, Estero, come on in and check this out. I broke it. <laughs> that was great. Thanks. And Christ. I like the last one she did. Yeah. Is that the one you felt comfortable about? Yeah, I mean, I like I like them, them all as far as, like... Yeah. The perform I mean the performances obviously are I just like the purple colored one. It just looks the purple <laughs> color is a nice <laughs> color. Yeah, nice. Let's but check it out. I think it's uh, I think it's pretty good sounding bike pre. You like it? I do. Good. That's that's what I wanted to know. Cause if you like it, I like it. I, I uh, <laughs> when I was playing with it at home, I liked it. But there's nothing like a real world experience. Yeah. What do you think? That's flat, right? There's yeah, no yeah, EQ, yeah. right? You no, know, there's no EQ on that take at all. When you when you were it wasn't recorded within the EQ, and it's not being played back with EQ. It's just no. strictly the mic pre. That's the mic pre with the little reverb. So and that's that's, uh, that's what you're hearing. That's my friend right? David Perlman. That's his mic, right? It David is. Perlman, Mike. David Perlman, what's up, dude? That was lovely. The mic was lovely. You like them both? Yes. How can you tell the difference between what the mic's doing and what the preamp's doing? I can't. You can. I can't. You're the one singing all sideways and stuff. You got the best mic technique of anybody I know. <laughs> I know for end results. We ought to, you know, we ought to try this mic through the mic preamp. I bet you sound good <laughs> through that. S sing a line through that. <laughs> Cause you lie to the lie. See, I told you. Ooh, that sounds chills. good. Um, that yeah. Lavery is the new SMG. So while well, we got you here. Um, this is a song that we're in the process of finishing up, mm -hmm. mixing for the album. It's going to be a single, depending on the strategy. It might be the first or second yeah, single, but smart. It's a single. but I <laughs> love this song. I can't get this song out of my brain when I fall asleep at night. I have to listen to talk radio to get this song out of my brain. Nice. I would say it's not particularly good. It's just undeniable, kind of. You can't. It's really kind of really catchy. Well, you know, you're known as a singer-singer. You're known as great lyrics. 
And this is Estero, E-S-T-H-E-R-O. We're going to grab some of our other albums. And when's this album going to be out? I don't know yet. I'm a month late handing in. I'm supposed to hand in on the 31st. And so hopefully we'll hand in. So soon. When are we going to hand in, Dave? <laughs> uh, Drew? <laughs> Back to you. <laughs> <laughs> Soon. I think we'll be able to finish this up, finish up this week. Okay, we're we're so close. We're now at the last little small yeah. tweak stages. So we should be able to finish up yeah, this week. Yeah, we're emails away, I think. All right. I'm just super excited. Okay. Uh, oh, I want to give a shout out to uh, Pensado's students on Facebook. Yeah. Greatest bunch of guys in the world. It's, it's the hardcore version of, of what we do. And they're going to love you on that. So uh, back to you, Dave. Oh, hey, everybody. Like I was telling you earlier, um, Joe Barisi is our guest today. Um, Joe is known for, and if you go to his website, you, you're going to be impressed as I was of all the all the records that you like. It seems like Joe was a part of them on some level. Uh, we're going to talk with Joe about every single one of those records, Herb. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that ought to be fun. And next week we're going to have the details of the giveaway of, of the gear they just saw, correct? We're gonna set that up, and uh, aren't you supposed to like, like on on real shows, they have that that real announcer -y guys that are not a lot, not a boys with the to the wire, not a bomb. Aren't you supposed to read that? Or <coughs> well, you raise the level of your co-host <laughs> based on your host. <laughs> so I don't have to go very high in this week. So yeah, guys, next week make sure we're gonna get you details uh, of that great BAE gear. So so stay tuned. We're gonna do something really special. And now on to Joe. Cool, man. Uh, Tool, uh, Queens of the Stone Age, a couple of records, Wolf Mother, uh, one of my favorite rock bands ever, Australian band, the Melvins, Bad Religion, on and on and on. Joe, welcome to the show, man. Good to see you, my Thanks friend. For having me. Thanks, Thanks for, for coming by. Me. Cool, man. Good, Good to see me. you. Absolutely. Drew, pay attention. What's up, Joe? <laughs> What's up, Drew? A um, little bit of background on you. You, you, and we'll we'll morph this into a question. <laughs> um, you, you 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 have both listened to a lot of records and shedding and learning, and, and yeah. then you also have listening to a lot of professors and shedding and learning in your background. Uh, and when you reflect on the path that that you've taken to get here, uh, it, that was a pretty good way to do it, right? A combination of both, one without the other, would would be a little less fulfilling. Yeah, I think it's uh, it was it was important for me to actually fall in love with music and uh, and try to uh, explore it in every possibility. That's why I went to school. Actually, I learned to, just wanted to learn music, music theory. Um, found myself in the studio and said, "What is this?" I you know used to roadie for my buddy who was the greatest guitar player I knew and go to studios and 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 see what's on the other side of the glass. And that's that's really what sparked it for me. And then. So your first musical experiences were like as a guitar player? Yeah, yeah, actually. I uh, started playing when I was seven um, after watching The Partridge Family and decided it was mm. cool to pick that chick. <laughs> you know? I was like, all right, man, I, this guy has all the girls, man. I have to learn to play guitar. And, uh, and um, being in bands and, uh, and listening to music and, and, you know, getting in the inside of album covers, uh, LP sleeves, and yeah. just trying to figure out what's going on behind it. And uh, it's a lifelong... Uh, process, man. It's a journey that I it's still virus, every every it's night. Too. I still sit before I go to bed and read a magazine or a chapter in a new book on Teen Beat. You still I still I'm still <laughs> looking at Teen Beat pictures and. Uh, <laughs> and I tell you what, I'm with you. I'm with you, my friend. Uh, were you in New York, in New York City proper, or upper state, upstate? New York? I was in Staten Island actually, oh, okay. and uh, early on moved down to Tampa, Florida, and then moved back to Staten Island, moved back to Tampa, and then ended up after going to college at USF for a little bit, um, left to study classical guitar at University of Miami, and that's when I kind of started uh, taking recording classes and recording bands, being in bands, and then came out here to an AES show, actually, and uh, put on KNAC, and Iron Maiden was on the radio, and I was like, man, i got to move here. This is the greatest place on earth, you know? And, oh, yeah. and never, I never ended up graduating. I'm a credit shy, and uh, just it's you know, they say all the greats never graduate. Well, you know, they haven't given me my diploma just because, uh, you know, I'm so close. But at that point, I, I didn't really want to do an internship. I already had a job when I moved out here, so. And, 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 and in terms of education, um, 
how do you apply that to mixing? Um, would you recommend going a formal education to, to, to people or uh, like myself, I had a fairly informal education. Uh, I think it, uh, it, it maybe, you know, maybe um, well, what do you really call formal? I mean, going to a college, I, I honestly don't know if I, the greatest thing I got out of school was uh, is learning where to find the information that I wanted to learn. I agree, 100%. I, I didn't know per se how to uh, do a lot of the things I wanted to learn how to do until I moved out here and sort of did it on my own. But, um, you know, there's there's education, especially now. I mean, we, we would wait for a year for Mix Magazine to publish the L.A. Studio Directory and jot down, you know, now you can go on the Internet and look up anything you, you would ever want. So yeah. it's... Um, Education is that in your, in your the palm of your hand if you'd like it to be. Well, let's get right to the meat of it. Um, how do you mic a drum kit? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> that's that's part two next week. Um, Queens of the Stone Age, um, man, I, I, I love uh, Josh, the the, the singer. Yeah. Uh, the new the the fourth album he worked on that. Um, I. Uh, a cat on the internet. What was his name? Great, some great questions. Anyway, I just wanted to mention him. Um, Ko Ma wanted uh, a couple of stories, anecdotes about that record. There's a, your records have a, man. I mean, like a hip hop guy could 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 listen to your records and, and get drum samples off of them. You, you you know how to use the drums in a in a John Bonham, Keith Moon kind of way. Uh, both of them, uh, from speaking with you, I know are, are, are people you like. Yeah. Um, um, but yet the guitars, uh, me being a guitar player, the guitars, they got enough of the of the classic Marshall, you know, humbuckers through a Marshall or Strat through a Marshall sound, but they they sound modern. I mean, is that the way you hear music? You you you're, you're not you're not just a guy with guitars. You 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 use like I say on the show a lot. You use all 52 cards in the deck when you sit down and yeah. I, th I think uh, blows me away your records. Well, thank you. I, I'm honored. Um, to me, it's every every situation is a unique experience. Um, the Lullabies record in particular was interesting because it, it was one of the first times we actually tracked drums and cymbals separately. Um, which was, it's a challenge. You have to have a really great drummer. Joe Castillo is a great drummer. And um, making it comfortable for him to play kick, snare, and toms without actually keeping time on a hi-hat. Just to keep the isolation, to keep the mics more isolated. Yeah, so we can mic the toms from a foot away and, and knock it crazy, uh, sibilant, crashy cymbal room sounds, you know. And then doing the opposite, doing just cymbals and hats, and then melding them together and sounding like a drummer who actually played a drum kit and, and not an overdub. First Queen's record was completely opposite. It was virtually live off the floor, and it was two guys. Josh played bass, and Alfredo Hernandez played drums. And that, that was, was assembled over a long period of time with them. Yeah, but you had the responsibility of kind of gluing all that together. The the other cool thing I remember about that record was every song we approached in a unique uh, as a unique sound. And the great part of it was once we got a sound on the, everybody in the band, they would just play the song two or three times, and it was done. Didn't really need to be a whole lot of overdubs because we were track the drums, bass, and all the guitars live. Mm -hmm. Not nowadays we tend to do drums, go back, put the bass and the guitars back on. But we were trying to make each song have its own vibe. So there were there were sections. We'd call them phases. It's actually funny because everybody worked on the record. We'd we'd jot down this is phase 15. We're moving the drum kit to the corner. Everybody's playing through small amps. We're gonna you know mic everybody from behind on this one. It's just. Phase 16, tear it down, move everything to the other corner. We're going to put the mics in the bathroom, and we're running the drums through some guitar amps. And the that's that's uh, sounds like just more fun than necessary. Yeah, right? it was. It was. Uh, I mean, it really. It, you know, when you get into the mode of engineering all the time, too, you tend to do the same stuff a lot of times and try to challenge yourself, which is one of the you know doing records like that and also having your own studio and having your gear in, in every place possible. You can. Mm -hmm not do the same thing every time. On, uh, on the Wolf Mother song, Sundial, that snare is just, I, 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 know, I know it sounds kind of crazy to hear a whole song and, and remember the snare herb, but it was that good. I mean, it was that good. It's like, it's like going to your, a restaurant known for the best food in the world and remembering the biscuits or, <laughs> or something, but I'm telling you, this snare was that good. 
Uh, was it the same sort of process, a lot of experimentation? or, or uh, that, that record in particular, we had, um, we did that one at Sound City, which is one of my favorite places to record. And um, we actually had two different setups. We had a full-blown drum kit, um, and Mike Fasano was a drum tech, and he just bought a brand new uh, uh, chrome kit. So we used that just because it looked cool. Um, we used 57s on a lot of stuff, 421s, a lot of dynamic mics, and, and um, through the Neve desk at Sound City. But for some tracks, we decided to get a different drum sound. And then Sound City has a corner that's uh, all wood, and we put another kit in that corner, and I brought in a Helios desk that I bought 15 years ago. Oh, and, my goodness. Uh, and put a lot of the for those drums. That, for those that, aren't, that weren't even born 15 years ago that watched the show, uh, describe that console because that's a pretty pretty unique console. Helios is a uh, is a unique uh, sounding desk, and there's to me there's two eras. There's a black face Helios, and there's a brown face, and the the black is um, Stones and Zeppelin, all the uh, you know Olympic and Island Bob Marley stuff, and everything was done through a black face back in those days. And then in the 70s, it became the brown face Helios, and um, the guy who designed it, his name is Dick Swettenham, who was a tech at an Olympic, I believe. He had the craziest looking consoles ever because they, they were just like spaceships. They, they, they weren't long or deep. They were just uh, wrapped around you and they were in, you know, purples and reds and I've crazy never used colors. I've seen them. I've never used one. But the, the EQ points are insane. It's one of the most unique designs ever because the bottom end is just basically one knob and if you turn it one way, it boosts a certain frequency. And if you turn it the other way, you're cutting a frequency that you can choose, or vice versa. You can actually choose, you're cutting 60 hertz by X amount of dB every time, and you put it the other way, you actually have four or five different frequencies to boost. And the top end is fixed, and the EQ is peak or trough for dipper, you know, dipping for cutting is troughing and peaking. It's pretty advanced and, for the, when they came out. Yeah, it's, it's pretty crazy sounding. And, and some of the tr tricks, you know, Lenny Kravitz is a huge Helios fan. I remember um, he was doing a song in Chicago at Sound City. And his Helios were racked up in a, in, I think it was a 24 volt power supply, and uh, they were supposed to run at 36 volts, I believe. So he was starving them for power, and, and they sounded incredible. Just, wow. Is there a picture of one on your website? Um, I don't know if there is or not. Actually, I have two different era Helios. I, I bought one for, it was in shoe boxes when I bought it, and uh, um, I do have them rack mounted right now. So maybe I'll send you a picture. You can post it. But if okay. you ever do a little Helios. Um, Google search, there are some insane looking desks, They're really, really cool. Um, on uh, on uh, the Tool record, some of the guitar effects, spectacular. Uh, are the, uh, the, uh, on your website, you got a picture of like all your pedals laid out. Yeah. Uh, do you use a lot of those on that? Or I, I do. You know, it's, it's, uh, I like to pick and choose. Usually what happens is when it gets time to do guitar overdubs, I I'll go through the trunk. I have two huge trunks filled with guitar pedals, and I'll just pull out a bunch of random stuff that I might not have used in forever and, and some things that I know I'll need. Usually it's one or two of every kind of effect, a couple of different wahs, a couple of different delays, and, and they're always there, and, and those parts get... Developed the song. The song I want you guys to listen to is called "It's the Pot," right? The Pot, yeah. Uh, if you're in a school, don't go to class tomorrow. Just go listen to that song. Good advice, right, Herb? Always. That that uh, I guess there goes our. Uh, I guess. <laughs> no, our, our ITL next week is on truancy. <laughs> Let me explain something to you guys. I, I don't sleep much, so. Well, they're clear on that. <laughs> so when I sleep three hours, I'm not very, I'm not very good at this. When I sleep six, that's when I'm the best host. When I sleep eight, this is the Trial. crap you get. But I have medical excuses. If you don't believe me, you can check my doctor. I, I actually was discussing with Herb some of the re residual symptoms of an illness I recently had. So, so when, instead of making fun of me, you should feel sorry for me because I am a victim of a disease. Back to you. Uh, the tool record. And on that cue. You stood by the hip straight man did bow. Wow, what do you want to know? Guitar the, sounds. The, the, the guitar sounds, it's like, a, it's like a, being a guitar player. As you know, other drummers listen to other drummers and they always say good things. Guitar players were a little competitive yeah. and we tend to not give out compliments. Uh, as quickly as as we probably should. So with that background, 
compliments to the sounds, compliments to the player. I mean, the, the, yeah, the, the, the parts, the, 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 the parts themselves are just. There's a fine line between hypnotic and monotonous, and man, they're just hypnotic, you know. And that's a so, contribution of your, uh, that's a part of your contribution to the sound and, and and the quality of the sound too, but the playing too. Thank you. Uh, the, the players are great, first of all. So, um, I spent quite a few weeks in rehearsal, kind of just absorbing what was actually coming out of there, the guitar amps and the drums and the bass, and um, um, getting in the studio. Those guys are su super great about letting you do whatever you want to do as well. They they uh, advocate you taking your time and experimenting and um, they wanted to try stuff. Adam in particular wanted to have, you know, had a sound in his head that he wanted to have a pedal made. So I'd call all my buddies and say, all right, we need to make a pedal that does this, you know, and um, Justin, the bass player, wanted to try different amps out. So we ended up with a combination of, you know, the boogie stuff and the GK stuff. But guitars in particular was a pretty elaborate setup because he never, Adam doesn't like to wear headphones. So he'd love to play in front of his amp, which adds a lot to the sound. and. Um, we'd have a, a wedge actually blasting him with a mix going on, and he'd play in front of a 4x12, and I use a guitar splitter to split out to a bunch of other amps. And his sound is pretty amazing. He uses a Marshall and a diesel, but... You didn't reamp, you just... The sound is a function of what... what that you was it, yeah. And I would just set up a, a, you know, a whole room at Grandmaster. I wanted to do it back at Grandmaster, because that's where they did their first two records, and I wanted to bring that kind of vibe back in, unless it's a, you know... Um, it's a cool studio, it's a great vibe, and um, they had some great memories there. So um, I mic'd up a bunch of stuff. There was Bogner's and Rivera's and um, his Marshall and his Diesel, and basically I split five amps at the same time. And On the Queen's Lullaby, what what gave that such a such a, a unique, special sound? I haven't listened to the whole album. Uh, I, I, I make it to about cut one, two, three, four, and then I start over again. Uh, um, but the... the it just has such a fresh, unique vibe that uh, an under-compressed, let the musicians get loud when they get loud vibe. Yeah. Well, Is, was that intentional? Yeah, I mean, in general, those guys are great musicians as well. So, and the fact that a lot of it was recorded live, it, it really had a lot to do with the interplay between musicians. Which, when you when we do a lot of overdubs now, you sort of lose that. You kind of you're focusing on yourself playing a part as opposed to I'm playing in this ensemble. I mean, there, there's some songs where we wanted to sound like a circus, so let's put a bunch of guys around in a small amps that everybody plays big hollow body guitars with uh, big bees on them, and uh, oh, yeah. you know, let's, let's like old Gretches, and old stuff? Gretches and Yamahas, a lot of lot of Yamaha guitars, wow. believe it or not. I mean, some '70s stuff, but some new stuff too. And wow. and the fact that those guys use different amps. I mean, we had some you know clear four by twelves, made up, you know like Vista Light drum kits, a Vista Light four by twelve. <laughs> and weird That's stuff, cool. a, lot of, a lot of interesting small amps. One of my, um, when I was working on uh, Pink's second album, uh, Tim Armstrong was pretty heavily involved with that record. I got to meet and work with him, uh, and uh, you worked on I did a couple Fall of mixes. Back Down. Yeah. That was uh, uh, for, for, for Rancid, his group. Yeah. I, love, I love what you did on that record, too. Oh, thank it, you. it had a, an intimacy that I really liked, but one of the things that I liked uh, I get a lot of questions about panning, and one of the things about this record I like, Herb. You remember those records in the in the when Stereo first came out? You know, things were just pan crazy, or the first Van Halen record, things yeah. were just pan crazy. It's like you you're fearless, dude, when it comes to panning. You you'll put something in the next county if you think it sounds good. I, yeah, I don't. Or I, you'll put you'll put a lot of stuff in the middle. It's just how are you making those decisions? Like like the, the lead guitar is just coming out of. Uh, Ventura County somewhere. It's like... For me it's all about, well I mean as you know balancing, I mean when, once you have parts that interact together there's always, so if, you, if I've produced it then I'm sort of laying it out so I know it's gonna work against the other and, and you look at the contrast between distorted and clean and ambient and direct and it's really just about moving it in the stereo spectrum and trying to make it fit and also thinking about it as a listener when you when you're growing up and uh, you put your headphones on and you're reading the album sleeve and you're like what is that going on in the left speaker i try to have those moments I mean, on, yeah, on every record you know i know, I know exactly what you're saying. i was, I was the, the the retarded child that used to mute one side of a Beatles record so I could hear George Harrison breathing in between takes yeah, yeah, my <laughs> just friend. total nonsense you know i'd love to i'd love to 
I'd love to see this guy here, but I'd love to see him do a Kanye West record. You know, mm -hmm. just take those sensibilities, because you would lose nothing, but you would gain a whole different set of sensibilities. Because Joe, Joe doesn't, he, he's he's not a paint by numbers guy. Every every song has its own, uh, just unique flavor and vibe to it. If it were food, I mean, the man just does not use the same spice twice. You know, is that just instinct? gut, feel, or is it all sort of a pragmatic approach where you've thought it all out? A bit Some, of both. That's a bit of both. Sometimes it's boredom, too. Sometimes yeah. I just think uh, I've used this delay too many times and, and I have this other delay and, or something gets fixed and you're like, or you buy something on eBay, that's a very, you know, a super classic one. It comes in, okay, I need to put this on everything now. <laughs> and then you figure out what it's good yeah, for. I thought I was the only one that did that, Drew. Hey, Drew, you paying attention? I'm in the chat. I'm you in still the chat care, room. Drew? I'm here. Okay, good. I'm here. That's cool, man. Um, <clears throat> if somehow all your equipment got stolen and you only had $2,000 to make a record, how, be as detailed as you can, how would you spend that $2,000 to make a record? What would, what, would, what would you spend? You know, we should ask every guest that. If you only had $2,000, what would you buy? pay your rent, <laughs> so you had a place to make the record, then, yeah. no. Yeah. Me personally, I'd just call up Jason, let him mix it for two grand, but <laughs> in, 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 in your case, what would you do? I would, uh, well, I'll figure out a recorder first, so it'd probably be a hard disk, so there would probably be, uh, instead of an HD rig, it would be an, a double O something, you know, or an, an Mbox Pro. A Pro Tools rig? Yeah, and that would be my recorder, um, and I would probably just get used to using the plugins that come with it. And then spend the rest of the money on a pair of monitors and some mics. So, preamp. Yeah, I mean, 57s, you can't go wrong with on it. It's all about mic placement, as you know. You, you yeah. know, any mic will sound good. Maybe not. it's not the optimal mic, but if you move it around and treat it enough, it will sound great. Yeah. So, a um, couple 57s, um, any kind of power. Did you stay speaker? under the 2000 limit, Drew? Or are you adding that up? I know you were searching that as quickly as he's saying. I don't even know what an Mbox Pro costs. Probably about well, five hundred bucks, we'll, we'll, right? We'll That's give you say. eBay. You said eBay. We'll give him a little bit on that. Maybe uh, four fifty-sevens, another three hundred bucks. We're about a hundred under for uh, drug budget, right, Drew? Yeah, we're on. Okay, good. We're on sale too. <laughs> okay, good. Clearance. That's right. a great answer. That's a great answer. I, uh, I think people uh, when we had. Bruce Wadeen on, people were shocked that he would use an SM7 on Michael. Well, SM7 is essentially a 57 with a windscreen. Yeah. Uh, one of the greatest mics ever made. I, did, I used to do a trick whenever I uh, wanted a little more high end out of the 57s, I'd put them in the freezer right before the session and the, and the capsule would get a little stiff mm -hmm. and then I'd have to get something real quick. I'm not sure that I would recommend that. But. <laughs> <laughs> the manufacturer loves you. For um, you and I were discussing yesterday, and you had, you had, a, you had. Uh, I learned so much when we were talking yesterday. In 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 the in the in some forms of music, like let's say music that's not uh, performed by musicians, but is actually more program music. Uh, and this is not a hard, fast thing, but roughly speaking, the mix process is probably a 20% a function of the of the tracking and recording, and 80% and in the mix process. And when you've got a lot of live musicians, the 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 tracking process and the recording process is probably, in my way of thinking, a lot of the times is is 80%, and the mixing is 20%. What's your take on that? Am I am I just crazy? I know I'm going to get flamed on the internet, so help me out here, Joe. No, I mean I, I, you know, maybe it's my own ego or whatever, but I, I think I've worked on a lot of records and and labored over sounds and then handed it off to someone else to mix and it didn't sound any different. Maybe a little glossier actually. Um, so for me, I mean, you're, you're, as an engineer, you spend a lot of your time getting the sound together, making the get, making sure the performances are right. So you're um, always mixing when you're when yeah you're, you know down to recording. the level you put on there you know and mm -hmm. then you know I'm not saying you know outside mixes aren't great it's just because it's definitely nice to have an outside set of ears to come in and take what you've done and mm -hmm. elevate it to another level but but a lot of times if you're a um, 
passionate engineer, a lot of times what you do or hand in is going to be 80% done, ready to go. It just needs a balance, and you're and you're done. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's. Uh, um, in fact, in fact, I, I, I've been speaking a lot and thinking a lot lately. It seems like. The whole world now mixing is actually integrated into into the process much earlier in in every form of music now than than, than initially like it used to be in, in in the classic techniques to recording. Uh, we used to have it laid out on a desk, and then yours are tracking, and then maybe you put up another song and rebalance it, and then you get into you know there's always different configurations of a console, but now if you're working in Pro Tools, it's you sort of have your mix going and your your headphone mix is derived off of your balance you already have and you continue to pull up the same session so it's almost as if you're mixing it one from day one um, what 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 like like you're very generous with your time and with your thoughts your your website lists um, uh, a, 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 a course that you put together on how to how to record rock music which is just it's excellent and um, what what question do you get most often at your seminars? At your um, you you have people come to your studio once in a while and kind of help them out. Yeah. Uh, what what question do you get most often that just drives you up the wall? Um, the one I probably get most often is, "Can I hang out or be a fly on the wall?" And and what I started to do is just really just you know meet people at Starbucks and sit down, okay, why do you want to be a fly on the wall? What do you know? Did you go to recording school or you didn't go to recording school? Well, you know, give me some examples of, you know, what, what's your favorite record that you've listened to in the last three months? Who produced it? Where they recorded it? Mm -hmm. Who engineered it? Was it digital? Was it tape? Was it analog? Whatever, you know, I mean, and, and a lot of times most people aren't really hip to that at all. They just... They just want to be hang, uh, hang out or whatever, you know. And so it, it's it's um, the whole idea behind the Pro Sound Workshop was um, just interviewing these kids that really didn't have a, any initiative and, and realizing there's a need for somebody to maybe teach them the proper way of doing stuff. Or and only really to me, it's only the ones that really want to learn. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to, to weed them all out of there, but but I, you know mixing other people's stuff and, and getting other stuff in to, to you know sessions that exist and realizing wow the, you know the overheads are out of phase or mm -hmm. the mic died in the mm -hmm. second song and you didn't fix it for the rest of the record uh, you know mm -hmm. things like that it's just it's appalling so um, giving back and I and I noticed you know what I actually read your interview in SOS I remember and um, Maybe it was 2007 or something like that, so, and uh, yeah. I remember saying, "Wow, this this guy did." Well, hold on, hold on, hold on. Say that again. You what happened? I, I read your <laughs> I Dude, read your interview. I read Dave's interview in Sound on Sound magazine, and, All right. and I, uh, it stuck out to me. I, I remember again because we hadn't met, obviously, and, and um, I just remember, man, this guy is really cool because he's willing. This guy's a superstar mixer, and he's willing to give away his ideas and secrets to all these people. Because we know, you know that no one's mm -hmm. going to hear like you, but you're, you want to educate the masses so we can make better music, and I, and I think that's a great thing. Yeah, I, I shared everything I know with Drew, and he doesn't sound anything, he doesn't even sound very good, so he doesn't even sound <laughs> like me, so I know that it's about taste, and it's about... Um, He's got a cooler shirt than you, though. He does, but I've got, I've got a Jeff Beck CD. That, uh, that Joe brought me. Joe and I, as I said, are guitar players, and Beck is, Jeff Beck is my hero on guitar. Who is your hero on guitar? Um, wow. I mean, that's, yeah, that's a tough know, question. A tough growing one, growing I mean, up, who, who did you tend to play when, you're, when you were learning licks? Who did you tend to put on most often? Clapton? No, I, there's a lot of Jeff Beck, a lot of Jimmy Page. Um, in the classic rock era, Paul Kossoff for Vibrato, Robin Trower, Jimi Hendrix. Um, Paul Kossoff was free? Yeah. I almost brought you some free, too. Today. Oh, was, man. Uh, that's just pure, like, like even nobody, a year Nobody ago. used an A chord like free. Well, except for ACDC. ACDC. Yeah. Yeah, um, Malcolm Young is an is yeah. a example of a guitar hero to me. Malcolm Young is... Uh, 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 if you want to learn to play guitar, you should first master what Malcolm Young does and then move on to the, to the hot dog stuff, but... What was your uh, quote about the right and the left hand? Because Malcolm oh, Young is definitely a right yeah, hand. Yeah, uh, 
My mom said, as she was teaching me guitar, uh, I'm right-handed, but my mom said, the left hand is the technician, but the right hand is the artist. Mm. And uh, the difference between guitar players tends to be the right hand. Uh, yeah. I'll throw it out there because I don't care about getting flamed, but I felt like Stevie Ray Vaughan had the best right hand of anybody I ever knew. First of all, he played telephone wire. Yeah. I mean, he used like 12s or 13s or 13s something. 13s probably, yeah. And and he's doing like four fret bends on a, on a piece of on strings this big, but his right hand he just never missed a note. There, you know, it was just it was just. That's ah. the key to the technique, because a lot of times you can hide the left hand with distortion. It's hard to make someone play slow and clean. That's one thing I try to show people. Yeah. It works. You know, it's the right hand that really has to subdivide. That's cool. I could talk guitar all day, but I'm losing Herb already. No, it's actually cool. <laughs> Do you like guitar? Keep, Sorry, like guitar no. Keep going, though. It's very cool. Drew, you know what a guitar is? I've heard of it. Okay, good. <clears throat> Just checking. In terms of, in terms of, plugins, do you find uh, uh, a use for them? Much like guitar pedals, do you tend to think of your plugins kind of like the way you think of guitar pedals? I do. They all have a certain sound. Um, I have a lot of them actually, and uh, and they they all work in. You know, I love the Massey plugins, and 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 not the fact that they're cheap too, but they sound great. They work well. Um, yeah. There's so many companies, uh, um, but they are they 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 are unique sounds. Whether they you know they I got over it a long time ago when people compare the UA to the Digi 1176 mm -hmm. to a real 1176. Mm -hmm. Who cares? Who cares? I don't care. Is it compressing? Does it do what you want it to do? Then. And when you done. when you pull up a plug in and the presets are by a famous engineer that do you ever feel jealous? Uh, do you ever feel like I'm not Golly. a preset guy at all. I feel jealous sometimes, but I still use Chris's presets. But I go, man, I wish that was my preset. But I, it's so good, I got to use it, even though Chris's name is on it, and it sounds different with Chris's names on it. I've noticed too. <laughs> but um, but you tweak the preset, right? Well, you kind of have yeah. to, you know. I wish I didn't, but you kind of have to. Uh, I, I tweak everything from the lighting to the plug-ins to what, what my assistant's wearing. Everything bothers me, and everything needs to be changed at different <laughs> moments of the day for me. I'm, everything affects the mix. And, and uh, that brings up a question, like, like when you, when, 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 it, it, I, want, I want our audience to understand that this process is not paint by numbers. If, if you made a record on Tuesday and then for some reason it got destroyed and you went to make the same record on Wednesday, it'd be completely different, would different, it? Completely different, yeah. I mean, I, I mean it's, yeah, every, every day changes. I remember doing drums in uh, Electric Lady in New York and, and coming in and the room sound different every day. And they told me there's water that runs underneath, you know, some stream or whatever. As humidity changes the, the sound of the room, uh, your agree. attitude. You know, I you get agree. up in the morning and you've you've just uh, had the greatest breakfast ever, and you're super gung ho, and you're let's do this. And then you, some days you come in and you hadn't been able to sleep all night, and you know it's the wrong side of the bed, and maybe it's not the greatest day in the world to record vocals. But <laughs> man, I tell you what, it's it. it Mixing is a moving target. It's not a fixed target. Well, let's just say, recording is a, is a engineering is a moving target. And, and when 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 you get those questions like, what converter should you use? Should I use 96 or 48? Um, and and we give you somewhat short, flippant answers because it's a moving target. We we yeah. don't know. I mean. I, I tend to think maybe I would probably choose 96 over 48, but when I'm in the heat of battle, that's not the first thing that comes to my mind. It's, no, it's, it's about the song. How the hell do I get what's in my head to come out of those speakers? You know, it's yeah. it's it's like going on a trip, Herb. You don't just get in your car and start driving somewhere right. and hope you make it to Vegas, but you're actually heading out to Santa Barbara. <laughs> What, what Joe and I do for a living is the same way. We don't just go in the control room and work. We have things, and that, that, that thing in your head that you're trying to get to come out of those speakers changes by the minute. And when in Joe's case, he'll, he, on his records, you can tell that, that, that he went in with one idea but heard something that, and, and it just changed the entire thing, you know? Well, question for you. <clears throat> Why don't we share some of that 
with, uh, with our folks in the corner office. Drew, you got some questions in there? I do. Everybody's coming to my defense. They're saying you're getting on me. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you. He is. Well, okay. <laughs> let, me ask, let me address this. I, I tend to tease the people I love. I care about Drew. He's, he's, of, of all the assistants I have right now, he's clearly my favorite. Thanks, Dave. We got some good questions, though. Uh, a lot of people asking. Uh, we had a few questions about um, roads and panning. Um, question for Joe. What is Joe's general treatment for roads type sounds or roads keyboard sounds themselves to give presence without overpowering the mid-range sounds? Um, sometimes it needs to be a super stereo thing, you know, and it goes back and forth between speakers and, and sometimes it just collapses into mono. It ends up in the corner because the part it's playing is a counterpart to what the guitar might be doing. So um, depending on the mix, depending on on the, you know the song, it, it really is going to depend on. It's situational. Yeah. It's it's situational. Well, if, if, there's, if there's no guitars, you'd do it one way. If it's got, if it's if it's a ballad with just a Rhodes, you do it one way. If, yeah. got, if it's got to compete with a bass and a guitar. What else you got, Drew? Oh. We got a question from Hendrix of Hip Hop saying, "Hey, Drew, ask Dave to ask Joe about his chocolate habit." Or his chocolate bar habit. Oh man, you ruined my joke, man. I, I, I no, no, no. I, 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 I talked to I talked to Joe yesterday, and Batters uh, Batters Box is coming up in a little bit, and Batters Box is going to be about guitar pedals. But I was going to trick him, and my last question was going to be Godiva or Ghirardelli. Oh shit. And and I wanted Joe to go what 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 because Joe's a chocolate fanatic according oh, okay. to. Uh, I'm um, going to say Nestle right now. <laughs> <laughs> there, you go. Nice. there you go. Good answer. Absolutely. The uh, one, the, actually, Drew, oh, yeah. real quickly, there's a, a question went by earlier from, I think it was Nuck Music, and the question was, ask Joe what guitar sounds he uses for Dave's illness. <laughs> <laughs> Not to start laughing while you're That's here, great. But, uh, Anyways, Drew, I'm sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, man, don't don't make fun of the handicap. We. <laughs> A uh, question from Gristleface. Can Joe talk about the low end on Welcome to Sky Valley? Ooh, good question. Um, wow, man. I mean, Sky Valley was a 14-day record. I remember that. Caius, to me, was one of the bands that was well, probably the closest thing that I can equate to recording Black Sabbath in the day or something. It was a band that set up live in a room. Um, once the sound of the band was established, they would just play. It was all about mood. We had oil lamps shooting against the walls, and um, and those guys just—it was all about listening to each other. And they would play songs that might be six minutes long, and then they'd start jamming, and it could be twelve minutes long. Um, the bottom end of that band is really derived from uh, um, the low end coming out of the guitar amps as well. It's not just guitar and bass. It's uh, it's ampeg amps. There's a lot of ampegs involved in Queens and and uh, Caius recordings and. It's a unique bottom end. It's not like a Marshall bottom end. It's it's more low mid. It reminds me of some early Pat Travers records. Yeah. Uh, Pat out of Miami, Miami. Yeah. Did you ever work at Quad Radio? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so managing it, I, I mean, it's it, it was really capturing it. I mean, it was there. I just I'm not even really sure how to manage bottom end. Honestly, I just it's one of those things that you just kind of know when it's right. I, I try not to cut stuff unless I have to. That's one thing that most people I know talk about cutting and shifting and getting rid of stuff. But I'm a, I'm a booster. I call it full Canadian setting, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I can't I can't mention Pat Travers without mentioning Pat Thrall, who was the other guitar player in that band. My buddy Pat Thrall. Good dude. Um, okay, hey Drew, question for Joe. A couple weeks ago, Sweden, uh, Sweden, said that compression is for kids. How would you respond to that? Who asked that? A few Bruce people. One, one person wrote it. Uh, Distag Distagel. Can't Why does he it. say, hey, Drew, every time he reads the question? Drew's become famous. Okay. <laughs> Anyways. Compression is for kids. I thought tricks were for kids. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, compression seems to be the one thing that most people are obsessed about. And uh, I think back in our day, we, we would ride the fader more than compress. That was our human compression. Mm -hmm. um, I compress for effect. I compress because I want stuff to sound hard and up front or stuff to sound squishy or stuff to breathe and pump. But uh, I think it's the most misunderstood uh, part of audio. I People agree. assume they need to throw compression on stuff and I want you to have your singer move around the microphone 
back off, I mean, it all comes down to proper recording techniques again. Mm -hmm. Dynamics get squeezed out of everything when people misuse compression, so. Yeah, there's, there's, there's also trends that seem to kind of come and go in the recording process and in the recording world. And like reverb tends to be a, a trend. You know, we were dry in the 90s and then we're wet in the 2000s. And, and compression is now a, a, a trendy thing right now. And, and uh, I got to tell you, I've said it before, I'll say it again. Compression was probably the last thing I understood. And there's still elements about compression on the stereo bus that I don't understand to this day. It, it's, it's, I think Joe, Joe gave us some insight and in that compression isn't necessarily used in one way and I think that's what confuses a lot of us. It can be used as an effect, it can be used as a tool, it can be used in a number of different ways, but um, I did an ITL on compression. We're going to come back and look at that again because a lot of you guys are interested in that. Good question, by the way. Yeah, we got, uh, we got time for one more? Sure. Cool. Uh, Funk Momo 2. Uh, another question for Joe. I mix mostly live records and often have to replace the verb of the room. What do you use uh, for re reverb in the box, if anything? Uh, reverb in the box? Wow. I mean, Altiverb is great. Um, Revolver is great. I've used uh, any of the Digi stuff that comes with Pro Tools. Um, you like the convolution uh, reverbs then? Yeah, I mean, but although, you know, sometimes, a lot of times I'm using some uh, crazy distorted vocal, you know, through a reverb and uh, and having that as an effect or a backing part. And it could be just deverb or whatever the cheapo digiverb is. Mm -hmm. It's not a convolution. Uh, for yeah. me, when I'm tracking, it's more about putting the mic to get the verb I want, and then I can add some stuff later. But I don't think I have a particular one that I'll reach for. Um, I do reach for Echo Farm, and that's reverb in a way. It's a delay, mm -hmm. but you can use the delay as for space. So, mm -hmm. um, sound toys stuff as well. Echo Boy. I like sound toy. True. Oh yeah. Um, this is a, a question for me actually. I was. You do tracking, mixing, producing, and everything. Do you prefer to take it from scratch, like a project, or do you just like prefer recording more than mixing or producing? or all the above? I think I'd like to do all the above because like, when you have an idea of what a, what a band sounds like and what a song should sound like, it's kind of my engineering part, um, what I, what's in my head will apply to how I think I'm going to mix it or add stuff to it later and then the production is sort of the overall picture. I mean, in, in, the, in a way when you're tracking and you're the producer, you kind of know what you need to get and how you're going to get there, or you, at least you hope you do. And, and so to me, it's, it's weird to track. It's only happened a few times for me to track a record, hand it off to somebody else. But I think, um, I, you know, and, and I, I, you know, I'm not, I, I personally wish I could mix better. I don't, I'm not a finesse mixer whatsoever. I just do it, and that's where it is, and it has a little personality, whatever. But um, I think I'd rather have that than have something handed off to somebody and have it evened out. So I, the, the long-winded answer is I'd like to do it all. <laughs> Bruce Wedeen said a couple of weeks ago that that if you want to learn how to be a good engineer, you should go to a lot of live music events because then you can hear what, what, what live music should sound and feel like. And that's basically what you just said. The process for you is part of hearing the original source and then trying to, in some way, recreate the feeling that you got when you heard that original source. So Did you work on, on a reggae thing as well? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, uh, the Light. Matisseau. Uh, Modest Hour, yeah, with David Kahn producing, yeah, oh, it, was, like uh, it was cool. I mean, I try to, you know, branch out and do a lot of different kinds of things because I don't want to be pigeonholed into just being the metal dude or the bad punk rock guy. But right. I think, as, you know, as a mixer, you, you um, music is music. You enjoy oh, it, absolutely. you add your thing to it, and um, I've done quite a few different, you know, I worked on Regina Spector with David as well, which I love working with David because he, he definitely um, challenges you. Because I'm so used to my world of either tape or Pro Tools, and he's a Nuendo guy or a Logic guy back in the day, so I was forced to learn how to manipulate audio in that realm and, and hear stuff differently and frequencies and things. So it's it's great to be able to learn from guys like that. Dave also made a um, a record with Paul McCartney over at uh, God, when was that? Maybe five or six years ago. Yeah. One of the most honest records I've ever heard in my life. And he's a motorcycle guy, too. Yeah, yeah, he is. He's funny. Dave once told me that he, he, all his biggest hits he whistled on, <laughs> like on 
on Walk Like an Egyptian, all that yeah. stuff. Dave whistled. I have a triangle hit on every record, actually. Are you serious? Yeah. But sometimes so, so it's obvious. So we need a more triangle t-shirt There's for you? one triangle hit on, or at least one triangle hit on every record I've worked on in the last 12 years. That's cool. And sometimes you make a note to document that, Drew. That's help from the audience. We're going to find some examples before he leaves. <clears throat> Actually, oh, Drew, why don't you hit us with one more and then we'll tee up Batter's Box. Oh, I can't wait for Batter's Box. Okay. Uh, question, vocals. Did he use parallel compression with vocals and what did he do to make it sound more aggressive with a better vibe? And did he use saturation on vocals? Who, who asked that? Emil Seven. Okay. Um, I, I actually tend not to use a lot of parallel compression on vocals. I, I uh, either single compress or double compress. Um, on the Lullaby's record, we actually recorded three mics at the same time, which is a, wow. it's pretty interesting. And most of it was recorded in a bathroom. So there was a super pristine Brauner uh, Klaus Heine edition mic that I was trying out. And right next to it, an SM57 through a Helios, Black Helios, just distorted. So there was my edge. And then an ambient mic, which was super compressed to bring out the, the ambience of the toilet at Sound City. Did you spend a lot of time? For, with face correction, or you just got lucky the first I just, time? Well, I just, you know, I use it to taste. The, the first two, the, obviously the Brawner and the 57, the, the diaphragms were as close as possible. Oh, okay. And, um, and, but they were treated so drastically, and, and I would record it to three tracks, and just so I could commit to how much distortion, and per mixing, how much distortion I wanted to add in a, in a chorus. If I wanted it to pop out, I'd just blend in the distorted mic instead of parallel compressing. Cool. Batter up. Roll I, the batter's box, Will. Oh, man. Ryan's graphics are incredible. Absolutely. Far away. All right. Today's, today's batter's box, Joe, we're going to do guitar pedals. I'm going right. to turn into Dr. Joyce Brothers here. Last week, my hair kind of looked like Dr. Joyce Brothers, if I recall. <laughs> You're being kind. I know. My daughter says I look like Julia Child. So, <laughs> Drew, you're still on the payroll, Drew. You cannot laugh. When she was drunk right. at the end of the movie. <laughs> but <it> was <laughs> I got to get another daughter. That was good. What was that Saturday Night Live skit, though, when she cut her finger off and the blood was... Yeah, I saw that. that okay, batter's box. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, rapid fire a couple of... Uh, um, things to you, and tell me your, your go-to guitar pedal for these. Okay. Chorus. MXR micro chorus. Really? Yeah. Echo? Uh, it would be a tape echo, usually a Watkins tape echo. Uh, Watkins, yeah. I, I saw that on your web. Uh, wah Wah? Um, I'm going to say Vox Wah, actually, although yesterday I recorded some insanely great Wah playing, and it was a Jeffrey Tease Wah. It was amazing. One of the songs, um, uh, The Bronze, what was the Wah pedal on that? It was probably a Fox Wah. The Fox Fuzz Wah volume control. That's one of the best the, Wah sounds I've heard, man. I love yeah, that sound. Great guitar player. And uh, Flanger. Um, ADA Flanger. Really? Yeah. Are those still being made? They reissued them, but I, you know everybody says they sound different, but I, I couldn't tell you. Mine has a small knob. I don't know if that's a real one or a reissue. Drew has a small knob. Uh, overdrive. Uh, I'm going to say Ibanez Tube Screamer. Really? Yeah. The green one? The green one, the 808. And then uh, Sustainer. Ebo. It classifies it, as a pedal, right? I, I, uh, judges? Ebo? Judges are not going to allow that, I don't think. All right, That's then I would not say, a pedal. And then I'd say it's more compression than sustain for me. Would be, I love, uh, hold on. Was our A staff sending some love, applause love through? Boss hand clap. Is that, is, that, is that Will, Ian, or Ben? It's all of them. It's a collective effort to shame us. That's the boss hand clapper pedal. <laughs> yeah, I used to have one of those. I do. I have it. I use it all the time. Ed C on the show. So, 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 uh, so South you, you squeeze the Ebo. I actually love Ebo. So, Ebo. The, so I'm override the judge's decision on that. All right. Uh, fuzz. Um, either a swollen pickle by uh, uh, Way Huge Electronics or the Another Unibox green pedal. Super Fuzz. The pedal you can't <clears throat> do without. The pedal you can't do a record without the brand. And the pedal. Ibanez Tube Screamer. That's the one. It adds a little 
guts when you're doing some guitars. We need a little push over the cliff, reamp the bass through it, put vocals on it, distort it. With that, it's a great amp, a uh, great pedal. Okay, this one's from Herb. If you were stranded on a desert <coughs> island and you could only have one guitar pedal, what would it be? Same one? They're probably the same one, yeah. I'd be this Tube Screamer. Okay, well, Herb, Herb's responsible for that redundancy. Uh, your go-to pedal in the mix process. Um, does a Chaos Chord Chaos Pad qualify as a pedal? You use a Chaos Pad? Oh, I do. Stop the presses! An original one, I too. Not even a two or a three or any of those fancy new crazy I got ones the Chaos Pro. Applause. Applause, applause. Hit it. <laughs> Boss hand clapper once again. Yeah, absolutely. The sad thing about that applause is it's canned applause that was recorded in the 30s and all those people are dead now. Oh, God. Jeez. And none of the people who are doing this were born. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> nice, Will. Somebody's trying to get their own show out there. Uh, okay, last but not least, um, I'm going to sneak this one by you anyway. Uh, what's your go-to Kit Kat flavor? Wow, I'd say green tea. That's possibly the greatest. They milk. make the yeah. green tea Kit Kat. Green tea with milk, green tea with honey, regular green tea. Did you know that, sir? No, I didn't know that. Ginger ale. Wow. Sports drink. There's every Kit Kat. Flavor. The little things. Yeah. Da 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 with the Kit Kat. The, yeah. Those. They make all those. Fl I knew that there was chocolate, and then the the, the, the white chocolate. There's uh, over 150 different kinds, probably, and they most of them come from Japan, and they're regional and seasonal. So in like February yeah. and March, when cherry blossoms are blooming, they make cherry blossom Kit Kats, and they make Did passion you know fruit too? Kit Kats I'm around. Uh, right now. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I had a Spice Girls <laughs> candy <laughs> fanatic thing going on too. Kit Kats, uh, coffee crisps. You know. I have a batter's box question for you. Oh my God! I'm a little disturbed by something. How how did you know that Drew has a small knob? Damn it, Herb! You brought it back up. Because he he, sh on he the showed rail. me the flanger twizzles. Twizzle, the twizzle gotcha. flanger. The for those of you that have been astute and watching the show forever, you know about uh, Herb's usage of the twizzle flanger. It's a twizzle flanger. What's the number? You we'll, we'll explain it. Hit us, hit us, and we'll we'll do it on Let's comments. And make get a note. It back we'll do an ITL you. on Herb's yeah. twizzle flanger. <laughs> twizzle flanger. So well, Herb, a pork, I think we have a pork chop flavored Kit Kat. Huh? No, I don't pork know if there's any meat flavor. There's definitely a, there's a, <laughs> so a only our audience soybean. Oh man, I haven't tried it, but we need to pull this back together. <laughs> I've had corn flavored before. I mean, next, what is, what's, what? What is, we have like somebody wanting to know? Does he like the 44 one or the 48 k yeah. Kit Kats better? Yeah. So Joe, you can All see that. how formal our show is, how strictly <laughs> scripted it is, and how we stay right inside those lines. We got to have Joe back on soon. This Absolutely, has been man. more fun. Awesome. So, so, well, thank, thank you for you, having nice me. Nice to meet you. Pleasure. Please come back. Hey, had this much fun since the pigs ate my little brother, Joe. <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> Hang in there, team. That's uh, that's for my my southern friends. I got you. I'm we uh, I we have a little different language, kind of like you Canadians hey, have a little listen, different language. And then I moved to the south, so I'm real screwed up. That's right, because you went to college in Kentucky, <laughs> didn't you? I sure did. Sure did. Absolutely. That's cool. Absolutely. Well, so, man, I think we've taken this ship about as far as it's going to go. Yeah, just uh, again, as you as you usually do, hit us. Um, your comments are great. We we passed kind of an internal milestone that we thought we were cool. I think that, that we thought was pretty cool. Based on the comments and stuff we read, I think we were at 22, 25 different countries that viewed That's the show. That's just here so, from L.A. alone. <laughs> I got we're, Herb. We're gonna, I got Herb, Drew. We're going to get out of here shortly. But anyways, thanks. Make sure you see us. Um, send it to our Twitter handle. Um, you see it up on the page. Um, obviously, our email, Facebook, and YouTube. Um, thank you for your comments. Thanks for your viewership. And Dave, take us home. Thank you, Joe, for okay, being with guys, us. Thanks for really having appreciate me. Pleasure. it. Pleasure. Joe. Um, Thank you so much. I want you guys to go to Joe's website, check out some of the stuff he's done. It's, it, it's, it's, while you're staying out of school that day, just spend some time on his website also. That's, it, I, I, I learned a lot learning about things I didn't know about Joe Barisi. Next week, we've got Michael Brower. Uh, nice. That's going to be a lot of fun. Nice. Uh, I can't wait to get Michael in Batter's box. Uh, Joe and Michael are good friends, and uh, Michael's as colorful and, and fun as anybody we've ever had on the show. So looking forward to that. Uh, Will's organizing the giveaway. Um, 
What else? What else am I forgetting? We want to thank Drew, as usual. Drew. Big shout thank out to Zan, who you. is holding it down on the East Coast for yeah. us. And Zan sent me a couple of tracks this week that were really impressive. Good. Really Zan's good. an impressive guy. Really good. Time to roll. Oh, man, I hate saying goodbye, but I guess I have to. It's been fun. Uh, next week, I'll try to get a little less sleep, and, 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 and we'll get a little more serious. We got a, I'm, I'm really working on a good ITL. I'm going to be proud of for you guys to listen to that next week. Anyway, thanks a lot. We really appreciate it, and I hope you're learning. Hope you're having a little fun, and we'll see you next week.